Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about something that allows physicists to look at electric and magnetic fields from a slightly different perspective than usual. We'll specifically be focusing on electric fields in this video. We'll be looking at some of the mathematics that allows us to connect electric fields with this new perspective, but as always we'll be keeping the maths as simple as possible. So if you enjoyed this video then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Now in a recent video on my channel, I talked about magnetic fields, a related quantity to magnetic fields known as the magnetic vector potential, and how quantum mechanics told us that we probably don't know as much about magnetic fields as we thought we did. And in this video, I want to give some more context around this second way of viewing electromagnetic fields. Specifically, I'm talking about potentials. And we'll get to see just why these potentials are so useful. So let's start with electric fields then. The first thing that we need to know is that they describe how electrically charged particles or objects interact with each other. Positive charges are said to be the source of electric fields and negative charges are said to be the sink of electric fields. The lines we see drawn here in purple are known as electric field lines and they tell us something about what would happen if we placed another small positively charged particle in this region of space. It would be pushed away from the large positive charge following the direction of the electric field line and it would also be attracted toward the large negative charge. This makes sense, right? Because like charges repel each other and unlike charges attract. Now, another important point worth knowing is that electric fields are vector fields. This means we can assign a vector to every point in the region of space that we're studying. And the direction of a particular vector tells us the direction of the electric field, or in other words, the direction of the force experienced by a small positively charged particle, and the magnitude or size of this vector tells us something about the size or the strength of the force. Now, because electric fields are vector fields, we can study them using a branch of mathematics known as vector calculus. Because it turns out that there are certain mathematical identities, things that are true generally in mathematics, that apply to lots of different kinds of vectors, including our vector field, that we can essentially steal from mathematics and apply to our electric fields. And we can take these mathematical fields and combine them with the study of electromagnetism. That's the study of electric and magnetic fields. When we do so, we get some rather interesting results. An important thing for me to mention here, as I have done in many of my videos by this point, we'll be seeing a lot of this downward pointing triangle here. This is known as nabla or del, and I've made a full video about it, so check it out up here if you haven't seen it already. All we need to know for now, though, is that there are three important operators that we can use when studying our vector fields. The first of these operators is known as the gradient operator. This essentially takes what's known as a scalar field, a region of space in which we can assign a number to every single point, and it finds, for every single point, the direction in which the scalar field increases the fastest. In other words, we start with a scalar field, whatever the scalar field may be, we find the gradient of it, which looks like this written mathematically, and we end up with a vector field, where each of these vectors tells us the direction and size of fastest increase of our original scalar field. The second operator is known as divergence, which is written sort of as a dot product between the nabla operator and any vector field that we happen to be studying. Again, this is a bit abstract, but all we need to know is that divergence is written mathematically like this. And the third interesting operator is known as curl. It's written like a cross product between nabla and the vector field we happen to be studying. Yet more abstraction, but we'll see why this is important in just a second. Essentially though, these operators just give us some different kinds of information about the original field that we applied them to, whether that's the original scalar field or a vector field. And I'm bringing these up because there's a mathematical identity, like I mentioned earlier, an identity that holds true for many different kinds of vectors, which we'll be looking at here. The identity in question looks something like this. What it tells us is that the curl of the gradient of some scalar is always equal to zero. And for our purposes, the scalars that we're dealing with behave like the scalar fields that we'll be looking at shortly. And the vectors that we'll be dealing with look like the vector fields that we've already actually mentioned. But so for our purposes, the curl of the gradient of a scalar field is always zero. Why is this useful? Well, it's because we can take this generic mathematical identity and combine it with something specific from the study of electromagnetism. Specifically, this equation here, commonly known as one of Maxwell's equations. Now, I've covered the details of this equation in a separate video, so check it out up here if you haven't seen it already. But basically what we see here is that the curl of any electric field in a given region of space E is equal to minus the rate of change of any magnetic field in that same region of space B. 
In other words, the curl of an electric field is related to how quickly a magnetic field in a given region of space changes over time. Now, to keep things simple, we're going to assume that the magnetic field in the region of space that we want to study is constant. In other words, it might not even exist, or if a magnetic field does exist, it's not changing over time. What this tells us is that this term, dB by dt, must be equal to zero, since the magnetic field is not changing, so the rate of change is zero. And hence, for this scenario, we can now see a similarity between the equation that we're working with from electromagnetism and the original general mathematical identity that we saw earlier. Again, it's important to note that this only applies when there is no changing magnetic field. There is slightly more complicated mathematics that deals with when the magnetic field is changing, but we won't look at that here. All we're going to do, though, is to spot the similarity between these two equations. We're going to see that the electric field in this region of space that we happen to be studying could be described as the gradient of some scalar field. And so that's a definition that we're going to create now. The electric field is defined as the gradient of some scalar field. And this scalar field is going to be known as the electric potential. And for a couple of different reasons, we're actually going to stick a negative sign in this definition as well. But one really convenient or intuitive way to see this is to recall that the gradient function points in the direction in which the scalar field is increasing the fastest. But for convenience's sake, we want it to point in the opposite direction, the direction in which it decreases the fastest. Why do we want it to point in the direction in which it decreases fastest? Well, to answer that question, I'll just quickly mention here that if you've ever studied electric circuits, you might be familiar with the term potential difference. Sometimes it's called voltage, just to keep things simple, and it's literally a measure of the difference in the value of the potential field at two points in a circuit. Positive charges tend to move from areas of higher potential to those of lower potential when moving around a circuit. So the term potential difference is not just a random name for a thing in electric circuits. It's literally the difference between the potential values at two points in the circuit. And these potential values directly relate back to the electric field, which is what causes our charged particles to move in the first place. Now let's go back to looking at a generic electric potential field. Here's an interesting fact. The actual value of the potential at any point in this region of space doesn't actually matter, and it's not uniquely defined. What I mean by this is that there's no specific set value for electric potential at any point in this region of space. All that matters is the difference between potential values at two points in this region of space, any two points. And so a really convenient way to see this is that our potential field could look like this, meaning that the potential difference between, for example, these two points is going to be 100 volts. But equally, we could choose to say that our potential field looks like this instead. And so the potential difference between the same two points is still 100 volts. And you'll notice that the potential difference between any two points is still preserved, but the actual values of the potential at any point do not matter. This is very similar to the following scenario. Let's imagine we want to climb a mountain. We can choose what we define as being a height of zero meters. Most commonly, we do this by defining sea level as a height of zero meters. And therefore, maybe we calculate that the height of the peak of the mountain is 1,000 meters. But maybe a goat living halfway up this mountain decides that zero meters should be the height of its favorite patch of grass. This would mean that sea level is now at a height of negative 500 meters in this new coordinate system, and the peak of the mountain is at a height of plus 500 meters. This is also a valid measurement system because the difference in height between the peak and sea level is still 1,000 meters. The most important thing we're learning here, though, is that we're working with a rather clever goat. So coming back to our potential fields, then, we can choose what point in our potential field we want to set as being at zero potential. Now, when we study electric circuits, we commonly choose the wire that is grounded or connected to Earth to be at zero volts potential. This is just a convenience thing. It doesn't have to be this way. And it's similar to how we choose sea level to commonly be our height of zero meters. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Hit that bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload. And please do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.